All right. Thank you all for, for tuning in to our Nordic SaaS briefing. My name is my name is Carl Westberg. I'm a partner with GP Bulland uh, based out of our Stockholm office. In the next uh, in the next hour or so, uh, we'll be discussing global software trends. Um, we'll be giving a brief update on both public and, and private market activities. Uh, and towards the end, we'll do uh, we'll do a fireside chat with Hugo Vernoff, uh, founder, uh, founder and CEO of rapidly growing edtech software business Cognity, uh, about their <clears throat> their journey uh, through and to the the first 10 million euros of ARR and and beyond. Um, I'm really glad to be joined uh, today by my colleagues John Campbell, uh, partner partner in our San Francisco office and also heading up leading our software practice, uh, as well as Inge Hayden, uh, long-term trader, uh, partner, and heading up our public market products and, and strategy. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to add them in the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, we'll be picking those up after each uh, each of the sections. So with that, uh, I will get us started with a few with a few slides just to give an update on on the Nordic market. Thank you. I think we can go to the next page. Um, so it's been a very deal intensive last twelve months, um, which I'm really glad to be able to say, and and I'd, I'll also add nothing we expected uh, a year back or, or a bit less than a year back. Um, but, but I think uh, what, what we have seen, and, and this is a selection of, this is a selection of the deals that we've been able to do in the last 12 months. Um, the market is really, the market is really there. The market is open. Uh, it's, it's close to an anything is possible uh, mentality. Uh, which has, to some extent, come as a consequence uh, of, of people being very, very, very focused on work, uh, being able to to see how how people can can actually get working from home and so on to to work work out really well. Uh, it's it's also interesting to see that uh, of the of the deals that we've done in the in the last twelve months, I think very close to seventy percent uh, have been in the software space, um, the SaaS and, and software space. Next uh, slide, please. Everyone is talking about SaaS. Um, <clears throat> we have these indices that we track across the subsectors of technology that, that we cover. Uh, and if we look at the performance, the returns in, in the public market uh, since Jan last year, after the, the market sell-off, uh, around this time last year, um, the, the performance has been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, and if we see the, the dark blue line being our, our Nordic SaaS index is up 124%, um, 124% since Jan last year. This is also after the rotation away from tech uh, in, the last, in the last few weeks. Uh, so, so quite uh, a, a remarkable outperformance of, of the of the overall market at at 23 uh, percent if we can go to the next page please um, so as bankers and, and also investors uh, we love to talk about the rule of 40 um, and and while this is a, a refined uh, regression analysis on, on public comps valuation um, it, it is being widely adopted and, and used, and, and it clearly shows. So this is for the Nordic SaaS companies. It clearly shows uh, how, how the public market rewards um, the combination of, of rapid growth and profitability with very, very high, with very, very high revenue multiples. Um, so if you scored the the, the rule of 40, so 40 percent. Um, I think you can expect the, the regression line here clearly shows north of, of, uh, of 10, uh, north of 10 times 2021 uh, revenue multiples. Yeah. 
if we go to the next page, please, I think we have private market. Yes. Um, but wh while the, the public market has been has been performing really, really well, and there's been a lot of activity inflow of capital investors favoring the recurringness of, of the business model in SaaS, the public, the, the private market has, uh, has been extremely active as well. So this is, this is private placements, uh, technology businesses uh, ranging up to $300 million. Um, we can see that the, the activity remained high throughout the last year, uh, and it even picked up quite a lot towards the end, which is something that we have seen continue in, in 2021. And if we go to the next page uh, and look at the M&A activity, uh, that pattern is even more clear. Um, I think coming out of the of the slowdown period during summer, uh, summer last year, um, deal activity has really picked up pace, uh, and a lot of a lot of deals get get done. Um, and I think I think we have a, a bit of a, a short list on the next page as well. Yeah, so so um, you know just to pick out a few. Um, HR, HCM deals, uh, both Planda and Pecon uh, got traded in the last few months um, to, to strategics. Uh, we saw the consignor Unifound deal um, come through with Francisco Partners and, and Vitruvian. Uh, we did the 20, 21 grams deal with Unified Post uh, that, that IPO'd um, a little more than six months ago. Um, site improved to deal with Nordic Capital just to just to pick out a very a very few. Go to the next page, please. Um, but there are there are still a lot of highly valued, rapidly growing, uh, interesting technology businesses that remain independent um, that that uh, continue to to achieve milestone valuations uh, and uh, through through uh, even more impressive funding rounds. Um, Klarna, Epidemic Sound, just to point out uh, two recent examples. And there are, and there are many others. Uh, so an, a very, very interesting time with a lot of interesting uh, independent technology businesses in, in the Nordics. Next page, please. And the IPO market, uh, the IPO window is, is very much open. Um, um, the list of, of uh, technology businesses and businesses uh, that are preparing to, to go public is, is longer than, than, uh, than in, a, in a very long time. Um, so the IPO market is very much a viable, a viable option at this point in time. Um, and I think on the next page, we just have a summary. Um, <clears throat> so this in all uh, makes for a very interesting situation for owners of software and, and technology businesses in general, uh, where there is now a multitude of, of options, attractive options available to owners. Um, everything from, from sort of non-common equity structures <clears throat> to minority stakes, uh, minority deals, private placements, IPO, as, as just mentioned, we now have the SPAC concept in, in the Nordics as well. Um, but but also a lot of U.S. listed SPACs that are actively looking for for uh, for targets in in Europe, including the Nordics, um, and and of course the the M&A route with with both strategics and, and private equity. So to to summarize, we we see a really really interesting time in the market with with a lot of activity and, and a lot of attractive options available to to entrepreneurs and, and owners. Uh, and against that background, uh, Jonathan, I would like to hand over. I'd like to hand over to you to give us an update on the 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 last, the latest in uh, in software trends that you pick up over in San Francisco. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Carl. Uh, great to be with everyone here today. I wish we could be doing it in person, but um, happy to share some thoughts on what we're seeing in the space and both from a U.S. and, and European. Um, perspective. So we um, we put together some thoughts on um, you know a, a few things. I'd say qualitative trends that, that we're seeing across enterprise software, um, which I'll start on. Really, three main trends that, that we're hearing a lot about from 
CEOs and, and investors and, and the public companies as well. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into some additional quantitative data kind of piggyback, piggybacking off of what, what Carl just went through, but more from a, a global SaaS uh, perspective. Um, so in, ter in terms of the trends, and I think we'll have a slide here in a second, um, but really what we're seeing is that there's been, you know, with remote work kind of taking over, there's been a strong acceleration of uh, digitalizing small and medium enterprises. Um, I think this spans, you know, anywhere from local businesses to, to global enterprises, um, but really focusing here on, on the SMEs. And with, with HR software at the core, it's, it's been able to help remote work and, and get people um, set up at, at jobs and working collaboratively, um, you know, very, very well. We've seen this in transactions we've done um, this year, selling Recruity to uh, PSG, Providence Strategic Growth, last month, um, and a few other things that, that we've been working on across the HCM space. Um, but I, I think going back to pre-COVID, there wasn't a lot of SMEs that really had sustainable HR software solutions in, in place, and, and now they do, and, and that's that's been a big change um, you know, over the last several quarters. I think the second trend that we would really call to attention is um, rapidly growing beacon technology um, despite consumer first policies. And, and we, I think the industries we've seen this in have been retail, healthcare, hospitality. Um, beacons can really add advanced technology to, to nearly any mobile application. Um, they were developed a long time ago, you know, back in the probably 2010 to 2012 timeframe. But over the last few years, there's been significant advancements in, in this type of technology and with multiple use cases, ultimately benefiting consumers um, in a big way. Trend three would be just more generally that the SaaS bloat you know, has been bulldozed is, is how we say it. Um, you know, software continues to, to kind of eat the world and, and eat enterprises and be a big you know, workforce function um, and now I think businesses and enterprises are looking for ways to aggregate control, manage their sub, their SaaS subscription and, and internal software ecosystems in general. Um, a good, I think, case point is a deal we announced yesterday. So in a company called Clean Shelf to Lean IX, um, two European companies and Clean Shelf is focused on SaaS utilization spend management. Um, so definitely playing into this trend, which, which has been been a hot sector. Trend four onboarding has become a, a point of differentiation for, for SaaS companies. Um, this has led to an increased focus of finding new areas for companies to differentiate as they um, use software to basically re replace every human task with, within an enterprise. Um, so more automation, I think the RPA companies like UiPath and and others have have, um, have really been the, the, the leaders in this category. Uh, and then finally, micro SaaS is making waves. So I think several years ago, we um, talked about software becoming more of a sweet play. Um, and now I think with so many solutions out there and, and you know best of breed point solutions, you're starting to see micro SaaS um, come back. I think there's ways of looking at that market being a, um, you know, a $50 billion market with a, a huge, a huge growth rate. Um, so we're seeing a lot of SaaS businesses start to target niche markets and, um, and, and try to grow in, in a narrow focus. And, and maybe some of you are, are running those types of businesses. So um, we, we think that's an exciting area and we plan to pay much more attention to that as well. Um, and then finally, mass consolidation of the marketing tech landscape continues to happen. This you know, spans across the CX space, social, um, you know, consumer surveys. Uh, so, so we're seeing big, um, you know, peer play companies do pretty well and Qualtrics and Medallia, companies like Sprout Social, Sprinkler, um, all becoming, you know, important public companies. And I think the big, um, the big strategics like Adobe and Salesforce and Oracle, Microsoft, et cetera, will we'll continue to make some co consolidation plays in, in those spaces at, at billion dollar valuations um, and up. So an exciting area to, I think, watch on the deal front. So th those would be, again, a, a hot take on, on some half a dozen trends we're seeing across the, the sector. Now to get into some data, um, 
as I think Carl alluded to, we do track about 70 public SaaS companies in our own G people SaaS index. Um, here are some of the top growers. I think we've cut out the top quartile of revenue growth, which is 28% and above for these public companies. Um, Zoom, you know, growing at 325% is, is, is amazing. And you can see it in there. Uh, you know, revenue multiples being above 35x. Um, but as a whole, this this top, you know, the top growers are, are actually trading on average at, at 30 times revenue for um, for the prior year and call it 25 times revenue for, for the current year. Um, so even as the market's been a bit volatile, I think over the last few weeks due to interest rates and monetary policy, um, you know, the, the, the SaaS businesses have great fundamentals and we're still seeing, you know, extremely high valuations. I think we can skip the next slide and maybe go to, um, so we've talked about some of these deals, but yeah, this this graph is when we, we really track closely on a weekly basis. Um, and you can see over the last five years, our SAS index, you know, again, this is a global index, um, US, Europe, and Asia, um, you know, represented, but you can see the index as, as you know, grown, I think, at a steady rate until COVID and then, you know, really took off um, and then has come down a little bit, but, but still, I think, holding strong at, um, you know, for these companies, 16.7x trailing revenue and 13.3x forward revenue, which is, uh, you know, about 60% in both cases higher than the five-year average. And even the five-year average at 8.4 8 and 10.1x revenues, respectively, is, is still pretty pretty high from a just a valuation standpoint. So folks are definitely investing in, in revenue growth and a software take all you know, mentality. I think as we double click into this, you know, really top quartile and, and for you, those of you running private companies, you can, I think, relate this as you have, you know, usually high growth rates. But as we look at the top quartile of SaaS companies, um, you know, on average, they're, they're actually the growth rates have been about 36%, um, you know, with a few outliers in, you know, Snowflake and Cinch, a great Nordic company, um, and, and Zoom as well, although I think we're just looking at some historical data here, so it doesn't show that 300% for Zoom. Um, but but you can see um, even the fastest growing companies here are, you know, if you relate it to private companies and it's much different scale, so hard to do that, but they're they're really just growing in the, in the 30s. Um, and, and you know, deserving these, these really high valuations. And then I think we have seen a focus more on the bottom line. And, and I would say that European companies have done a better job managing cash flow and just you know, free cash flow and EBITDA margins than US companies. Maybe it's just due to the abundance of venture capital in Silicon Valley. Um, but you, you can see here, a lot of the SaaS companies has at, at scale have turned to be cash flow positive and actually have very high EBITDA margins for the type of growth they have in the scale. But on the right, you know, there are companies that are still burning, you know, money and investors are still willing to underwrite, you know, significant losses if all the other metrics and the unit economics are make sense and in, in our, our best in class. Um, I'd say the next, uh, after growth and after just you know revenue, um, recurring revenue models and gross margin, I think that the next most important metric in, in the markets right now is net revenue retention. Uh, we show it here as dollar retention, but it can be euro or um, you know any sort of metric there in terms of the currency. Um, that ma magic line of 100% is an important one. I think the best in class, you know, software companies are really 120% and above. And they have the ability to upsell customers um, after landing them. So a, a classic land and expand capability, but also retain customers. So they're usually the gross retention, you know, percentages for these companies are in, are in the 90s and they're able to upsell into the well, well above 110 and in some cases above a 120%. Um, it's a really a strong benchmark to, to be going after. And on the flip side, we've seen some companies, you know, that have revenue retention in the 60 and 70% range for software companies. And, and that just doesn't work. I mean, that, that's a broken model and, um, you know, pretty hard to get any type of valuation for, for that type of a business.
Um, so this is an interesting, you know, graph and picture on the GP Bullhound SAS score. And I like to say we've, we've actually made this up off of the rule of 40. So you have three components, your revenue growth percentage, your free cash flow margin percentage, and then your, your net revenue retention percentage. And you add those three percentages and then you graph it next to your um, enterprise value over forward revenue multiples. Uh, and that's what we've done here on a handful of, of public SaaS companies. Um, and it's, it's really just factoring in, you know, the net retention into the rule of 40, because we, we do think it's equally as, poor, as important. And I, I think the data works. You can see as the, as the GPB SaaS score goes up, um, the, the valuations have gone up and Shopify is a bit of an outlier, outlier but the rest of them are, are kind of up and to the right in terms of their, their revenue multiples and, and very high you know, revenue multiples in general on, on this chart. Um, I think here, you know, we could skip over this slide just because Carl spoke a little bit about the rule of 40. Um, this, this slide actually shows the SAS index and how they trade on the rule of 40. So similar to the SAS score, but just factoring in rule of 40. And again, pretty clear line, lineation between, you know, higher multiples and, and a higher rule of 40 score. Um, I still think, you know, growth is, is kind of the, the king in valuations in, in that if you have resources to invest in either growth or making your business more profitable, we think um, investing in growth, growth is the right call, um, but also to have a, a very balanced approach and be able to, you know, to have a reasonable uh, free cash flow margin, whether it's positive or slightly negative. And then finally, some, uh, you know, some specific data on, you know, some of the top SaaS companies. I think we can flip to the next slide, and, and this is all available in our SaaS reports for folks. Um, again, we have Cinch on here, which has been a great, a great story out of out of the Nordics, um, and then a mix of um, U.S. And, and and European companies. And I think all of these U.S. companies have had huge strategies to try to, um, you know, expand and grow in, in, into Europe over the last couple of years. So we've we've seen that you know quite a bit just on the ground here in, in the U.S. That, that's kind of it on, on the SaaS space. And um, again, we wanted to make it pretty crisp, but, but um, you know, a great sector right now. And, and I'm sure a lot of you, again, are, are either running or investing in businesses like these. And, and we're always happy to chat about that. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, John. That was, that was good. I think we'll, uh, we'll take that growth is king uh, as, as we move on. Um, I'd like to... I don't see any any questions coming so far so i'd like to hand over to you inga thank thank you very much and uh, i i really hope i get some few questions uh, on, on my presentation so please go ahead and, and ask questions if you have any questions um next slide please uh, as you already heard the market loves the SaaS model it's stable revenue with good visibility so for us on, on the public side, it's very easy to build models. And that's exactly what we like. We like stability and uh, an ability to forecast the revenue growth. The software as a service in the cloud also, uh, sorry, can you jump back one slide? Uh, means also that it becomes very, very scalable and gives us leverage going forward. So we definitely look at the scalability of the business model and what type of leverage uh, the software will give the company go going forward. And thereby cash generation should be strong. So that's really what we're looking for on, on the public side. Uh, if you look at Lego of software, all of them are also moving to SaaS now. And there is a transition period, which is costly, but in most cases they are able to move the model over to, to the SaaS model, but it, it's a costly uh, exercise to do and can take a, a while for some, uh, sometimes. You probably remember uh, the Q4 numbers from SAP, uh, you know, the biggest uh, company in Europe in software, which really guided down for the next coming years due to, to the movement. And this week saw Nemetchek doing the same thing in, in their uh, building software part in order to oh, move to, to the SaaS model. But in conclusion, I would say the market really, really loves uh, the business model in itself. Next slide, please. 
So what about the public market SaaS in the Nordics? If we start off with, we have a strong culture in the Nordics about fixing problems. Uh, so in, in many, many countries, it's about uh, lining up to and doing what you're being told and just work on, on the projects you're doing. But in, in, in the Nordics, we have a really, really good history of trying to fix problems and trying to develop things and questioning the tradition. Uh, take Astra Lusik for, for example. That's one of the big, good examples in history where you did something on the side which really become a super success, although uh, pharmaceutical. Um, we have a good education levels, uh, levels, a lot of engineers, few, too few still, but a, a really, really good level of education in the Nordics. The only problem we have and always had is the scalability for software. We have a small home market if you compare with the US, which means it's tougher to scale a lot of products we, we develop for the Nordic markets and then trying to bring it out in, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, the source model makes it more easy than normal software, but still there's a lot of tweaking that has to be done in order to, to drive the growth outside the, the Nordics or even the home market like in Sweden and so on. Next slide, please. So where are we in the short run? As you heard, the, the prices on, on the SaaS companies has been off, oh, so have been flying the last 12 months together with demand. It's been very, very strong demand. But lately, as you can see on these slides, uh, the price has become on, come under pressure and the correlation with the 10 year yield of the US is negative 0.93. So it's very, very close. Uh, and this is definitely driven by the valuations which are quite high meaning that a lot of the cash flow in the future uh, are in the future and thereby the, uh, the interest rate in terms of valuation model becomes quite, quite important. And next slide, please. So what do we look at uh, on the public side? We look at everything like Jonathan just mentioned, the rule of 40 and net retention and so on. But then we also dig into the scalability of the models for the different companies. We look at the sales process. How, how difficult is, is it to, to sell in the software in, into the different clients? Often it is the fact that the, the more difficult it is to sell it in, the more difficult is it to remove it also in the future. So the, uh, the upstart cost of getting it in it also comes back in, in some sense um, by, due to stickiness. But then Stickiness and churn is also something to look at. Uh, net retention is, is sometimes quite short term, but when we look at stickiness and, and, and churn, we look at it, what happens if we have a downturn in the market and, and so on? It, or is it the software you really need to have if, if, if the market, so the economy slows down? And also uh, what's very, very important you have a lot of technology changes. How sensitive are the product for technology changes? So for example, if, if, if I would take an example from my own life and, and also the fact that we look at it, it's like take Fort Knox. I have a number of paddle holes in Sweden and in Finland and in Poland. I can use Fort Knox in Sweden, which I do. I can't use it in Finland, which is really sad. I can't use it in Poland because they only have a Swedish product. So that limits the scalable scalability. The sales process of the product is quite simple. I, I just go in and click. I need. I, I know what I need, and it's a very similar product to other products. When it comes to stickiness and churn, we have churned. We have changed it. We started the operations in 2016. We have changed uh, supplier because uh, the stickiness is not that high. You can transfer the files and so on. And for us, it's more important that it's simple to use and that the price is right. So that's the way I, I would start to look at a company like Fort Knox and say, okay, what, what type of scalability is it? What's the sales process? What's the risk and stickiness? And also the fact that the pricing, what type of price increases can it make before they start to shine away from, from the product? And also, if you look at the technology in itself, it's not super complicated when it comes to the basic uh, accounting on, on, on Fort Knox, could it be that the model could change that somebody comes in with a free model and just sells commercially in the programs or some other type of model which could put uh, the business model at, at risk. So those are the things we look at very, very carefully. On top of that, the last thing I would like to mention is that 
for us, the devil is in the details. So if you look at the, um, the graphs that Jonathan um, put up and most people put up and, and look at the um, growth rate, uh, the rule of 40 and so on, there's a number of things you have to watch out. So take, for example, salesforce.com. What's the growth of that company? They bought so many companies, Newsoft, Tableau, Slack now lately. So what are the underlying growth of that company? Question mark, question mark. And if there is an acquisitioner company like Salesforce, why are they doing it? Is it due to the fact that they are widening the company or is it the fact that they don't spend enough money on R&D and thereby drive up, up the margin while they dilute the, uh, the number of shares instead? So for us, it's all about going into those type of details to understand uh, the company into details and um, the underlying margins, the underlying growth and thereby, from that point, choose the companies which we think will uh, outgrow the expectations and, and are cheaper than they look relative to the marketplace. So that's a little bit on, on our side on the public market. I just can mention that we don't have any SaaS investments in Sweden for the moment in our public funds. We have a number of them uh, uh, in, in US, but not, not in Europe or in, in Sweden. So that was really my presentation, and I hope there will be some questions. Yes, um, we do have questions. Um, what's your view on the Schrems 2 decision for, for the SaaS model? So that's data privacy. I think, I think when it comes to all of these uh, data privacy problem, problems, GDPR and so on, it's, it's, it's always a hassle uh, for, for a m number of companies uh, when it comes uh, to, to, to the SaaS models, but I, there's always a work around it, but it's a cost increase. I, I, I almost always see it as a cost increase uh, for the companies that they need to invest in order to, to work around it. But, most most cases they are able to do it but we have seen uh the the european commission or even the u.s regulators clamp down on some people that haven't been following the rules but oh it's it's equal for everybody in that sense it is indeed um i think that's it for for questions actually so um with that thank you very much Inga. uh always a pleasure um so moving us on i'd like to welcome uh hugo hey. hey hugo hey how are you very good very good thanks a lot for for joining us taking the time we appreciate sure. it thanks for the invitation so so you and i we, we've known each other for for a number of years by now uh but but i mean when you as you meet a new potential client as you meet an investor how do you how do you present Cogniti and, and yourself? Uh, well, myself uh, would probably be a, a countryside guy stuck in a big city, uh, but uh, Cogniti is um, really, as I see, the vehicle for me and uh, the team I work with to try to have a significant and global impact on the learning efficacy for um, the, the global student population. So we're very focused on uh, improving learning on a global scale and being able to do that over time. And uh, practically how we work to do that is through a B2B SaaS model where we sell a comprehensive teaching and learning tool to schools worldwide. So we have a, an integrated approach to this where we have ready-made interactive and engaging content. We have assessment, learning analytics and workflow. So it's a, turnkey solution for schools to de deliver teaching and sort of the engine that the learning relies on. So this is a heavily differentiated offering, even looking globally. Um, we see that it does have a, an impact on uh, learning outcomes at schools. So we accelerate learning, which is what we want to do. Uh, we sell this worldwide. We have a bit over a thousand schools in, uh, in more wow. than 100 countries at this stage. And uh, as per the title of, of the chat, we, we recently crossed uh, $10 uh, million uh, of ARR. So all, all those three uh, milestones were crossed pretty close to each other with 1,000 schools, 100 countries, and $10, $10 million of ARR. The, the stars are aligned. <laughs> exactly. 
Exactly. No, but that, that's fantastic. And what a, and congratulations on all, all of those achievements. I mean, it, it's massively impressive. Um, but, but I mean, as, as, as you correctly say, I mean, it is to, to sort of to follow your journey from, from the early days all the way through to, to you know, passing the, the 10, million, 10 million mark. Um, tell us a little bit about the background, how, how it all got started. What was the vision that, that you saw and that you decided to, to go for? Yeah, so, so me and my co-founder, uh, Nicholas, we had our first stint in organizing exam prep courses for high school students. And we did this while we were still uh, studying um, economics at the Stockholm School of Economics. And when we organized those courses and met students coming to them, we uh, very genuinely fell in love with uh, helping students to learn. So it, it might be a cliche thing to say, but uh, when you're exposed to the, the kind of gratitude you get from helping someone who struggles with learning, uh, it's just incredibly rewarding and felt uh, a lot more real than than the part-time uh, jobs we had done in, in uh, other uh, areas before. So um, I think that's that was really how we got started, that we wanted to take that value delivery and bring it to real scale. And when we started looking at the ecosystem and uh, the global landscape, we realized that students... Uh, we're learning and still are learning much in the same way as, as uh, we did when we went to school and that our parents did and that tech hasn't really accomplished much yet. And, and I said, that's still the case. Now, now during COVID, obviously, some schools and teachers have been forced to change, but the level of unpreparedness among schools has had a pretty sad impact on student learning. Um, but, but of course, uh, ed tech and how to use technology to improve learning outcomes is something that's moved from uh, far down the agenda for schools to at the very top. So overall, I'd say that everything is uh, left to do and, uh, and we aim to, to hopefully do a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. It will be, I mean, unfortunately, I think it will take several years until we fully realize the impact that the pandemic has had on, on things like the school system of, you know, among among many other things of course um but but through through this journey that that you've been on uh you've obviously accomplished a great deal um what what would you say have been the hardest things to achieve along that along that journey so uh first of all most things are pretty hard i think <laughs> Uh, but I guess you can split it into two parts where the initial part of building a business is, is simply about finding product market fit. And that's, uh, uh, it's a humbling experience. So we had some grueling years in the beginning where um, it uh, feels like you're banging your head against a brick wall over and over to try to get through. Um, you always get your hopes up when you speak with customers that if we could just um, change the product in this way or, um, or build this feature, that sales will start happening. And then of course it takes um, 10 times uh, um, three months or six months with those uh, elations where you get very enthusiastic and then you get slightly disappointed, but then ultimately you find it. And once you, fi you find it and sales start to happen, um, it's, it's really scaling challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd say scaling challenges, you can split those into two categories where one is to optimize the growth. And that's essentially about uh, not screwing up too, too badly uh, and uh, not doing too silly mistakes. And the other one is opening up new innovations to enable further growth beyond the growth trajectory that you're already on. And these innovations can be commercial innovations or product innovations. So it's really running the sh ship and finding a, a good direction for it. And uh, the common factor between those two is that both rely totally on what team you get in place and how you make that team work together. So if, if I were to, to sort of boil down what is it all about um, and uh, what is the most difficult thing, it's always about, it's, a, it, it's what you, and what you spend the most time thinking about is how do I build the team to really unleash the full potential of this um, concept? Because once you have 
the concept and you know approximately what the business is about, it's really all about uh, the team after that point. So how, how have you been thinking about that? I, <clears throat> I think you and I, we've talked about it in the past and using culture to achieve greater goals and, and to align that with, with other you know, with other OKRs or, or goals in general, but but how how you been thinking about that, and what what have you been what have you done? Yeah, so yeah, there there's team and uh, culture uh, and strategy and execution uh, and, and all of those combined into the metrics that investors look at. Um, and teams sets the other factors in that equation, or at least uh, heavily influence them. So culture, strategy and execution or derivatives of, of, uh, of the team. So it all starts with uh, the right hiring and, the, and hiring starts with realizing what kind of uh, competencies and personalities and experiences could really accelerate the uh, company's journey in a significant way. And once you've identified what you want, it's about being able to attract and select. So this is about hiring basics, right? It's it's um, it's talent acquisition. Uh, so so I think that's um, arguably in a growing company the most important function yeah. in, in a company. And then uh, I'd say for culture, there's a lot of uh, um, th there has been a lot of misunderstanding about what culture is about. I think it's clearing up, but to me it's really just a performance management tool that you can apply to the entire organization. So if uh, leadership practices are uh, sort of like sales in that it's one-to-one -one where you can have the eff effect, culture is like marketing. It's one-to-many communication where you can impact the performance of the entire company. Um, you can work with culture in various ways, but uh, the basics is to have a very clear expectation on how do we act and interact at this mm -hmm. company and ideally performance um, performance attached to that and of course recruitment and so on um, and then after that it's it's continuous implementation by workshops uh, discussions um, promotions offboarding and so on and and doing that virtually works equally or equally well <laughs> definitely more difficult especially the continuous implementation mm -hmm. at, or parts of it. So some of that continuous implementation of say a set of behaviors that you've defined as being the ones that you want your company to run on happen through clear artifacts where it might be the hiring process, it might be performance management process uh, or other HR processes or, or how you structure team meetings. So those, I think, carry over really well to a remote setting. But what's more difficult is the, um, the, the informal continuous implementation that happens through you as a person. So through the founder and through the management team, through the small micro interactions, also the interactions that are, go on in a company become a lot less visible when they happen on Zoom calls versus in the corridor. So it is more difficult to, to govern, um, but, um, but yeah, you have to find ways of working around that. It's sort of like the like privacy regulation, as you spoke about before. You can always find ways to work around it. It's just a bit more complicated. Yeah, I think some, someone, smart person we spoke to said, it, uh, you, you, can, you can manage a lot of things virtually, but, but it's very hard to lead and to develop. And I think that, that, that is actually very true. Some things will most likely need a bit more physical interactions as well. Um, I mean, looking back at the journey uh, that, that, that you've done, uh, if, if you were to compare the first 1 million euro of ARR that, that, you, that you gained and, and that you sold uh, to the last one, to the 10th, um, you know, what are what what similarities do you see and, and you know what what are the main differences? Yeah, so uh, from, from from a personal experience point of view, I'd say that something that remains the same is the intensity of the experience. 
Huh. And any uh, downwards or upward spirals are self-accelerated, and it's um, an emotional roller coaster at all times, for good and for bad. Uh, it's uh, probably not the, the uh, experience you want to have if you want to optimize for for mental sanity, but it's uh, it's a great experience if you want to. I guess live on your uh, personal, the edge of personal growth uh, and personal questioning and and um, um, and forcing yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, and then some differences are that in the early days, there, it's there's there's this feeling of when you're a small team that are working out of a garage, whether literal or not. Uh, we had uh, our co-founders uh, abandoned office near Washta Post Terminal, uh, far out in Stockholm, where, where we sat for a year. Um, and, and no one knows about you, but you know that you're going to, uh, to conquer the world. And that's, uh, that's a feeling that's hard to recreate when you're bigger. You can still have the optimism, but this tight-knit team feeling in some way uh, disappears. And also, uh, the type of challenges that I spend my time on has changed. In the early days, it was all about output and the progress of the company was correlated to how much work I could get done. Now it's more about um, information, uh, structures, uh, judgment, decisions, setting, direction. And it's very, this very easily becomes uh, management and, and pure purely overseeing how things go. So you have to fight to keep yourself out of that so you can continue to build and innovate. Um, and, and, uh, but, but generally, it's, it's a lot more work on fewer, bigger decisions that set, set the path for the execution uh, of the wider team. Um, so, so those are probably some of the, the biggest differences from a founder experience point of view. Great. Great. Um, I, I know you don't like to talk too much about the future or at least not future performance, but could you, could you say something about your the growth strategy as, as John said, uh, growth is king. Growth is king. Definitely. Yeah. So for, for us, we, we have, um, global footprint already, but we want to go really deep in a few key geographies where we've been looking at, uh, different options, uh, to, to use that to build out um, a large and, and highly profitable presence in those markets. Uh, and that will be outside of Europe, because we see that when you get to scale in certain segments, in, at least in, in our industry, but I'm, sure, and I'm, I'm sure, or our sector, but I'm sure it's, uh, it's similar in other, um, in other, for other SaaS companies as well, you get super profitable because you know, the cross margins are there. You can increasingly automate a lot of the customer success. Mm. Uh, it just becomes a super, it get, becomes a great cash generation. Um, and I think with that, we can sustain uh, our approximate current growth for, um, for the coming three years. But we have also set some longer term product and business model innovations in motion. So for instance, around product-led growth, where we, you let the product distribute itself. Um, that, and, and I think some of those innovations mm -hmm. could accelerate growth further mm -hmm. after that two to three year lead time. And then over time, of course, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, the, the ambition is to become the industry defining company internationally. And, and we think we can do that. I'm sure you will. Um, um... I, I was going to. I, I know we have. Uh, I know we have a lot of investors on this call, um, and and I'm sure I, I happen to know that you've been thinking about fundraising. What 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 are you what are you looking for in in an investor? Yeah, we are, um, and I, I'd say we're some some way into uh, a few dialogues um, all, already, um, and fundraising is always fun <laughs> and intense in its own special uh, way. But yeah, what we're looking for in an investor, I guess for, for me, it's ultimately a trust exercise. So I know from friends running companies, how 
energy draining it can be to have online investors. You want to really feel the investors out, understand who they are as people and what drives them and see if, uh, if they come across as genuine people and if you have value sets that match. That's at least very important to me. So it, about personal chemistry and spending some time to build, build that trust because th that trust that um, you will both be able to agree and uh, move forward together through ups and downs will save you a lot of energy uh, down the line. So beyond that, there is also um, uh, the need to, to be aligned on a, a risk level uh, and on where the company is going. So th that's something that we this time around have tried to be pretty clear about. Um, that we're not, we don't want to push cognitively, at least not in the short run, to uh, to triple uh, to tripling revenues every year because we don't think that's that's doable now. And it's investors who are looking for that kind of uh, growth should speak with other companies. Um, we know very much with what we feel very confident with what we can achieve during the coming two to three years and that we can accelerate thereafter, but we want to set expectations straight and uh, know that uh, we run this company pretty conservatively from a financial point of view to be aligned on that. And then everything else beyond that with value creation teams and so on, um, they can be nice. There's definitely an increasing trend. We see that a lot more now compared to two or three years ago that, that the investors are setting up value creation teams. So they, they can be nice and sometimes uh, could be a core value add, but mostly to be that's icing on the cake rather than the mm. actual cake. So they, the actual cake is uh, trust and then alignment on what the case is really about. Yeah, good. Some, some clear takeaways for, for our audience, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I, I, I could go on for forever, but, but since we have a couple of questions coming in, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pick up a few of those. Um, so we have, um, yeah, this is about selling to schools, um, which can be seen as a challenging sales process and, and probably something that you've been questioned uh, about in, in previous years from, from investors and others. Um, how, how do you how do you see that? How do you respond to to that question? Yeah, we we had to respond to that uh, question a lot, especially in the early days. I think because it is uh, it is a common trait among uh, edtech <clears throat> SaaS companies that the price points are very low, or conversions are very low, or sales cycles are very slow. Um, we can clearly see in our numbers now that that's not the case for us um, and i think that comes down to the product and the value prop we have that it is it is heavily differentiated we replace printed textbooks we replace a, a fragmented set of edtech solutions that the school has we can have and we sell at high price points and we sell with short sales cycles and we sell with very high conversion numbers I think we've uh, we've uh, had a lot of uh, uh, luck in finding a concept that that appeals to the schools enough, so that we have even with you know, non edtech um, benchmarks, pretty good uh, or or very good uh, sales metrics. Great, thanks. Um, are you running on Azure or or Amazon or other? Amazon. <laughs> it's a very, very pointed question. Um, and and then one, one may think that geographical expansion of cognitive depends on the open-mindedness of various contacts within the schools, teachers. Um, teachers could start thinking that your innovative approach um, is kind of pinpointing their weaknesses, uh, where, where some culture may accept it and some, some won't. Um, is, is that something you, you, you've come across? Have you, have you seen any sort, anything like that? It's a great question because what we can very easily see in our data is, uh, of course, which students are performing and which students aren't. And we visualize that both to the students and to the teachers so they get uh, the class overview. But we can also see uh, which teachers are performing and, and which teachers aren't, and which schools are performing and which schools aren't. 
we're not doing anything with this data right now, but it, it could be um, a gold mine, but one uh, which may uh, cave in on our, on our head as well. So we have to be careful about that. But otherwise, uh, uh, there, is, um, there is a shift in mentality that has been going on for the past 20 years uh, in the teaching profession. And uh, when I go to schools and, and speak with teachers now, almost half of the teachers are younger than I am. <laughs> so uh, they are pretty open-minded to technology these days, uh, mostly, not all. Um, some feel threatened by technology. Personally, I don't think the teacher will disappear, at least not in my lifetime, but I think the role of the teacher will change away from being what they have been traditionally, uh, which is a content repository that can regurgitate content to their students in front of a blackboard, to instead being a coach and a motivator that can help teacher or help students identify their pain points and then help students address those pain points or th those weak points or sticking points. So Uber, Uber ratings for uh, between uh, students and, and teachers in the not too distant future then. We'll see about that, but maybe, who knows. Uh, it, it seems you're you're very value driven. I agree with that. Uh, wanting to accelerate learning, have you seen any trade ups with this goal and financial goals? Um, uh, my personal belief is that the way to maximize impact over time is to build a super strong commercial engine, and that's also when we when we speak with uh, investors, we're very clear that we don't want any uh, mercy money or any. Uh, any investors making any sort of concessions on their commercial due diligence uh, or evaluation of cognitive because we want that commercial drive to be part of our NDA. Uh, if we wanted to go down a, a less commercial route, we could have deployed something to uh, 10,000 uh, students in, uh, uh, in whichever developing country and that would have been it. But with the approach we're taking now, where we're building a cash generation engine, uh, I, I hope that we'll be able to help um, entire countries in, in Africa or South America or Asia over time to really lift their educational achievement levels. That's going to be, that's going to take some time for sure, but I'm, I'm confident that the only way to really do that is through commercial models and, and to build a super strong commercial engine. Yeah. I, I know we're running out of time, but I'll just take one, one last question. Uh, thoughts on employee stock options? Yeah, uh, I am positive. We have them and um, I think they're a good thing. Those are my brief thoughts. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, Hugo, thank you very, very much for, for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. Uh, best of luck continuing the next, the next 10 million ARR uh, journey and uh, yeah thanks a lot for for joining us um, and thanks to 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 also to my colleagues and and to all of you for for tuning in uh, thank you very much Franze and the marketing team for making this for making this happen uh, and to to all of our audience thank you for for joining and uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions uh, you know where to find us thank you Thank you, Carl.